In the summer of 2020, I watched an extraordinary television series called Pose. Anyone here see it? Me. <laughs> it was about New York City's drag, drag ball culture, a kind of LGBTQ subculture in the African-American and Latino communities through the 80s and the 90s. And I watched this with my teenage daughter. One day, there was an episode where this fabulous character named Pray Tell, played, Pray Tell, played by the incomparable Billy Porter. He was suffering from AIDS and he was in the hospital dealing with side effects of AZT and AIDS. And suddenly to my daughter's horror, I started to cry. And the reason I was crying was twofold. One is I lived in the village in the 80s and 90s. And I saw men in particular all around me wasting away. And I didn't understand then the, the enormity of the loss and the pain. And watching this, it just, it just you know, kind of fell on me like a ton of bricks. But I was also crying because we were in the middle of another pandemic. And that I, I realized that there was no way I could, we could possibly fathom the enormity of the loss. And that in 20 or 30 years from now, we're gonna be watching a television, television series about just this moment. And maybe we'll begin to understand what this moment means. This is a moment full of grief. And unfortunately, the losses keep piling up. There's the climate, there's Roe v. Wade. You know, last week, many of us were struck dumb by that decision, even though we completely expected it. There's the Supreme Court's ruling on the EPA and the lack of controls on emissions in the society. We're facing relentless and senseless gun violence. People, children who go to school are gunned down, you know, in all their innocence. People who are shopping, people are going out to dance. There is so much to grieve. How can we? And I'll also ask, should we? Should we grieve? What would we want to grieve for? It's so painful. I want to argue that we should, that there is something about grief that is clarifying, purifying, and even enlightening. In that moment of my tears, I, I understood, even though I've read a lot of that, about the AIDS ep epidemic, I realized what I saw as a young woman that I didn't get until now. It was something about that grief that brought it home. Now there's such a temptation to walk through life numb, especially at this moment. Why should we feel? I believe that grief is the preparation every activist needs. It's what we need to resist what is relentlessly coming at us. Now, I don't wanna say that we can grieve every day and that we can feel it every day. That's not what's going, going to happen. But I think that we need to make communal spaces and rituals for our grief. Now, it's interesting. I usually look to the Torah as a model for what I can learn. And in these parshiot, in these portions, and I do and I don't. So, these portions, we'll see in a minute, are all about grief. So last week we had shlachacha, right? So the 12 spies, 10 of them are like, they went to scout the land and 10 of them are like, yeah, it's a, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, Ered zavad, chalav, duvash. But there are giants there. We're not going up there, right? We can't do it. And in fact, 
They said, if only you let us die in the wilderness. And they even started, they started to try to form a back to Egypt movement. They said, let us find a leader and let's go back to Egypt. Can you imagine? Back to the site of their original trauma, right? They were so traumatized, they almost couldn't imagine another future. And then there were two, Caleb and Joshua, who said, let's go, we can do it, we can do this. And what's really interesting is God's punishment of all the people who lost faith was exactly what they asked for. They died in the wilderness. They would wander for 40 years and ultimately die in the wilderness. They didn't have the courage to go up. So God said, okay, you're not going to the promised land. And what happened then? They grieved. They really deeply grieved. And then we move into this week's Parsha. And what do we find? Some guy named Korach, who is staging a rebellion against Moshe and Aaron. So we go from grief to grievance. We can't tolerate so much grief. It's too painful. We'd prefer to complain. We prefer to say to our leaders, you have no right to that power. Now, I'm not saying, and people who know me know well, I'm not saying that there's no place for challenging power, but I think it's really important to distinguish between a complaint and a grievance and a challenge of power that's really for the sake of the whole. Now, if we think about Korach, there's some interesting literary clues that tell us Korach was not interested in the welfare of, of the whole. Number one, it says the Parsha starts with, hold on one second, Vayikach Korach, Korach took. But there's no object for the verb. We never know what Korach took. So Korach, I can only imagine, as a close reader of the Torah, and as one person who believes that every single you know, little um, you know, letter and word in the Torah means something, and also the absence of a word also means something, that when it doesn't say what Korach took, I imagine Korach took nothing. Korach grasped. Korach took emptiness. Right? His challenge was really not about anything about except for not wanting to be in exactly the position he was in and feeling it. He couldn't tolerate what was happening for good reason with the Israelites in the desert at that moment. Moshe would fail to bring them into the promised land because they weren't ready to go into the promised land. So Korach blamed it on Moshe. There's some other literary clues. The very name of Korach um, refers to Deuteronomy 14.1. Korach, in one sense of this three-letter word, this three-letter name, um, means bald. And it refers to Deuteronomy where we're told not to tear our hair out in grief. So that's a really interesting connection between who Karach is and grief. And it also says, don't tear your hair out. Don't make, don't um, cut your skin. Don't make gashes in your skin. And finally, I'll tit go to do. Don't like tear yourself in pieces. And what Karach is doing to B'nai Israel, to the people of Israel, is tearing them in pieces. He's the ultimate in divisiveness. He's hurting the body politic. It's like a self-inflicted wound. The other thing Korach means is Kerach, ice. So, so interesting. Korach is the, is the man of ice and Moshe is named for what? For having been taken out of the water. So Moshe is the watery, fluid, flexible person who can, you know, who, who can sort of, um, inhabit any container, and Karach is that stuck, cold block of ice, right? It's like, let's stop the feeling now. That's who Karach is. So there's all these strategies for not wanting to fall, feel grief, right? First, there's the grasping, 
Then there's the, you have too much power, I want what you have. So failing to really inhabit and feel one's own life and situation. And then there's turning the grief against yourself and your community. And then finally, turning into a block of ice. Now I know that sometimes with everything happening in the world and everything happening in my life, I turn into a block of ice. Last week, we had this amazing be mitzvah of a young man named Caleb. It's almost like Caleb <laughs> stepped right out of the Parsha, right? And he was just this talented 13 year old boy and it was so moving. And at some point, a friend of his, who's a few years older, I think a close family friend, stood up and with all his beautiful presence, he sang One Day. Now that song goes, can you sing a bar of it? Just one bar. At that moment, for me, the ice melted. You know, the day after Roe v. Wade and the tears just, just kind of started to stream. And it wasn't only because of all the sadness in the world, it was seeing these beautiful children come up from the, in the world, like these non-binary, you know, children who represent the full spectrum of gender and humanity and who are challenging all our categories. I was so thrilled. Now, to go back to my teenage daughter for a minute, she's a little too challenging <laughs> of all my categories, but, um, but in that moment, I just was in awe and in grief at the pain of the world and in awe at the beauty of the world. Something really interesting happens in this Parsha. Korach and his men are swallowed up by the earth. Right? It's almost like they tried to grasp at nothing and nothingness took them. But the next thing you know, Moshe invites all the tribes to plant their staffs and there's one that buds and blossoms, right? It is almost like Korach unwillingly becomes a seed for life. Right, becomes that growing, blooming, blossoming, right, you know, just staff. And that staff, of course, was the, was the staff of Aaron, right? So the, the challenge to Aaron's authority at the end is completely affirmed in a symbol, not of death, but of fluid, beautiful, moist life. So what I bless for each of us going forward is that we connect to each other and find places where we can feel the fullness of what's going on, the beauty and the horror, the grief and the loss. You know, it's gonna take decades to really understand what we're living through, but right now, instead of going through life, you know, just numbing out, let's be alive, let's be that staff, let's bud, Let's bloom, let's blossom, let's feel.